Welcome to Understanding Russia, a student-led podcast from Belgorod State University. I'm your host, Ian. In a departure from our usual mission to explain some feature of Russian culture, in this episode, we will hear from my friend Val, who came from the UK to the Soviet Union a long time ago and stayed throughout the 90s. This is the conclusion to the first part of the interview in which we discussed his coming to the Soviet Union and how it was to grow up in the Soviet Union. If you haven't heard it, it's a good idea to listen to that one before you listen to this one. You're listening to Understanding Russia. Imagine a scenario in which one day you woke up to find that your local store had run out of butter. Well, you might be a little upset, but it's not the end of the world. You go to the next store along, but they don't have any either. The shop assistant tells you that there isn't any butter in the local area, but they might have some in next week. It's just a temporary problem. Disappointed, you change your breakfast menu for the week, so you go home and eat toast and honey. It's okay, but the butter would have made it delicious. Never mind. You decide to put a wash on before you leave for work, but when you go to switch on the machine, it makes a fizzing sound, and then no sound at all. Rats. You call the repairman from work and see if he can come round tonight. At work, things go from bad to worse. The boss comes in and tells you that your pay has been delayed due to unforeseen circumstances. Today, you didn't do much. You went down to lunch at the canteen, but all there was to eat was a thin soup and yesterday's bread. Oh well. The food was never great here. You meet the factory odd job man and tell him about the washing machine. He knows the model, but is sceptical about repairing it. He says those mini electrical motors are like gold dust at the moment. He should know. He moonlights as an electrical repairman. You decide to finish early. There's nothing to do. And you want to go to visit your brother in the countryside to help with his kitchen garden. You see, an economic crisis doesn't usually happen overnight. It is most often a gradual thing that creeps up on you. A political decision made hundreds or sometimes thousands of miles away doesn't always have direct and immediate ramifications. The events in the USSR between 1989 and 1991 appeared to most Soviet citizens as a series of shortages and political squabbling. Over a period of a few months, ordinary people saw the old order collapse around them, the rise of millionaires, a descent into political chaos, and a drop in living standards in some places so precipitous that countries of the former Soviet Union are still feeling their way back to normality some 30 years later mostly with limited success. The 90s are regarded by Russians in the same way that Americans see the Wild West of the post-Civil War period. It has rapidly become a mythological past and for some, a taboo topic. Nearly all of the social inequality we are experiencing today is a result of the societal collapse experienced in the 90s. The association of money with crime predates the 90s, but it is the decade in which these attitudes hardened. The rule of law broke down, and the social safety nets, already torn, were ripped into tiny shreds due to rampant inflation. A lot of former Soviet citizens fled to richer economies. Most could not. Val chose to stay for reasons that he will explain. You see, it is an old truism that chaos for most is an opportunity for some. Regardless of the collapse of one form of political or economic control, people still wake up in the morning and they still want to eat. This means that society must, and does, reorganize. While Russia's steady march towards order does not excite foreign media organizations, it is this aspect of the current regime that affords Russians the most comfort. Confucius cursed his enemies with the line, May you live in interesting times. That times in Russia are predictable and largely uninteresting is seen as a positive here. One or two things require a little explanation before we hear from Val. You will hear some names bandied about that will be familiar to anyone who experienced Russia in those days, but are mysterious to those more casual observers and to those not of our vintage. Gorbachev was the last leader of the USSR. Brezhnev was leader from 1964 until his death in 1982. Zyuganov is the current leader of the Communist Party in Russia, and therefore the preeminent political rival to the president. His platform is socialist, and he often makes speeches in support of public sector to workers and pensioners, critical of the government. Zhirinovsky is a prominent nationalist figure and populist leader who claims that the president is not strong enough in nearly every area, be it economics, immigration control, or military expenditure. In Russian eyes, Putin is a moderate, reasonable, and broadly conservative figure along the lines of Chancellor Merkel of Germany or Prime Minister Abe Shinzo of Japan. I mentioned the Gaidar reforms at one point. Gaidar was the finance minister of Russia under Boris Yeltsin, the first president of Russia. These reforms were called shock therapy here and were the point at which state ownership was abolished. Gaidar remains a controversial figure and is often vilified for the failures of the Yeltsin government. Now, as Val is a personal friend, I warn you that this interview is not exactly a classic of interviewing technique and more resembles the conversations conducted when having a barbecue at his dacha, although I try to keep it more or less on track for 
for your listening pleasure. I must also stress that these ideas are really Val's musings on what it was like to live through the years under discussion, and not the stated view of our university. While Val did work for the university for many years, he is retired and devotes most of his time to doing what pensioners do, while continuing to teach occasionally because old habits die hard, and he is sprightly and still very much in demand. So this interview reflects Val's experience and understanding of events. You're listening to Understanding Russia. So last time out, we spoke to Val about his experience coming to Russia, well, the Soviet Union in this case, and how it was to work and live and grow up and be educated in the Soviet system. He joins me again today to talk about what happened when the Soviet Union collapsed. He's going to give us some of his thoughts on how it is living in Russia today. Hello, Val. Hello. Hello. It's nice to be back. Nice to be back, yeah. <laughs> and we had a situation where I left off last time. We were talking about how people were a little, well, not shocked that the Soviet Union had fallen apart. It was more of a sort of when, not if, when you were living here. Is that correct? Well, that's right, because, you know, there was a feeling that something serious is going to happen right at the end of the 80s. It was uh, a decade when everything was collapsing, falling apart, and there's no food, no nothing, no services. So, yeah, something was bound to happen, and we had that feeling, but we didn't, of course, know what exactly would happen. So you saw, like everybody else, I suppose, on the television pictures of Boris Yeltsin. Did you know then that he was going to become a significant figure? Well, uh, yeah, we had the feeling that he would be. Because he, I mean, he was uh, full on energy in those days, right? He was very different from all those, you know, old cronies that used to sit in the Politburo and rule the country. So he was very energetic, though he was, he belonged to the Communist Party, but he handed in his party membership card uh, later on at uh, one of those uh, Politburo meetings or on the conventions and uh, announced that he's leaving the party and he's prepared to uh, to go back into civil service. So, the, yeah, uh, we thought that he sounds like uh, some kind of leader, which probably would make some significant changes. And there was a coup, and Gorbachev's the same age as him, I think. But um, Well, yes, yeah. but I mean, uh, Gorbachev was a kind of indecisive. He was kind of slow. He was a, an affluent talker. He could speak well, but uh, most of the uh, things he talked about was just just, you know, non-significant at all. They just talked about the, the, yeah, theoretical stuff and uh, we might do this, and might do that. And you could right, see right there and then that he had no definite plan what was going to happen, right? And which way he's going to guide the country. While Yeltsin, he was much more concrete, and much more decisive. And uh, he made that impression that he's really going to take us somewhere. So when the coup happened and then Yeltsin kind of rescued Gorbachev from that, did you know that was the end? Did you think the coup would succeed at the time? No, just by looking at, <laughs> at what was happening. You, I mean, it was, a, it was a fail, a complete failure from the beginning because you could see those guys sitting in five or six of them uh, in a row trying to <laughs> address uh, the press conference. You could see practically the, the, so to say, leader, the one who was going to take over or planning to take over from Gorbachev, his vice president, his hands were actually shaking like that. You could see right there. He was trembling, shaking. He was, went on mumbling and bumbling and saying that Gorbachev is uh, unfortunately uh, he's sick now, so maybe one day he'll come back, we'll see. And he went on and on. And, and I remember one journalist who was quite popular and very outspoken in those days. He focused on the uh, former governor of Tula region. He was uh, one of those, you know, old cronies of uh, Brezhnev and company. <laughs> and actually at the press conference, they addressed this guy and said, look, Mr. So-and-so, I don't remember his name, Staravoitov, I think it was. How did you end up in this company? He said. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that phrase said it all. Okay. I mean, everyone was really opposed to what was happening, starting with many regional leaders, journalists, and just us common people. We, you know, Talking about the common people, you watched all this from a television in Belgorod, presumably. Ah, uh, yes, yes. The tone of the news at that point would have been questioning, lampooning. What, would, what, well, what was going no, through them? Well, no, it was them? just stating the facts, really. That's all. No analysis, no nothing. Just stating the facts. But uh, a couple of days later, they stopped making news programs and said, "We're all going out in the streets." Right, we're going into the streets, we're going to join the people. 
and we're going to actually, basically what they were implying was that they're going to fight against the coup. It didn't last that long, did it? No, three days, I think, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. So that's when Yeltsin really came out. He came out very powerfully in getting on a, onto a war machine. I think it was a, an armoured personnel carrier or something and uh, made a speech and said, this is a coup, it's serious, we mustn't let that happen. How so, popular was that message? Because the impression we had in the West was that everything was chaotic and here was a new group of bureaucrats taking over, no longer calling themselves communist. I mean, what was the feeling? Did you feel like this was an epochal moment? Did you feel like it was just uh, incompetent business as usual? No, no, this was definitely something new. We could see that it was serious, right? It was basically maybe not planned, but it was a very decisive thing to say and eventually do. So it was a revolution? Well, in certain ways, yes. In certain ways, yes. I mean, revolution may be, uh, well, it could be an appropriate word for it because when I remember my philosophy lessons, the definition of revolution is something uh, like when, you know, the economic and political system changes completely. Yeah. So this was some kind of... We were entering some kind of interim period, changing from communist ideology to something we thought probably would be capitalism, but we were not quite sure because <laughs> what happened later uh, reminded us of the Wild West and uh, Chicago of the 1930s. So we thought, well, this is something that we don't really want. Well, let's take it person again. What were you doing when all this was going on? Were you teaching oh, here? Oh, well, uh, um, looking back at that time, I would say that, you know, a lot of people, especially seniors and uh, people, well, of my generation maybe as well, they weren't used to this freedom, right? When uh, Yeltsin announced, look, I'm giving you as much uh, freedom as you can handle, that was meaningless to, to most of the people because they didn't have an idea what freedom was all about. And when they started playing with this notion, it turned into chaos and anarchy, right? No democracy, no freedom at all. It was just chaos and anarchy. That's all. So how did that manifest in your life? Did you see an effect? Not really, because uh, actually, once again, I was saying that... Uh, Many people who were used to be guided through life, right? They were led by the hand, meaning they went from a cradle to grave, really, right? By the government when they are guided into school, guided to university, guided through the rest of their lives, given jobs, given flats eventually, uh, right, in the long run. They felt completely lost because there was nobody else, uh, nobody left to guide them through this chaos, right? As far as I was concerned, uh, well, I actually sailed through that period. So what was it that stood you apart, do you think? Well, I was into all sorts of things, right? I was uh, helping set up international relations because that was a very fruitful period of setting up new international relations because the West, all care, they all wanted Russia to, well, in those days, to... I don't know how much they wanted Russia to prosper, but they wanted to get into what was what was happening. And I was busy with setting up all these twin city partnerships and uh, setting up business connections and teaching people English. So, I mean, the 90s for me just flashed by. I was so busy. And as I said, I really sailed through that. You're listening to Understanding Russia. And it was a period when we uh, set up the Chamber of Commerce, which was something absolutely new for Russia, right? Especially regional. Well, that, in, that implies that although it seemed in the West like everything collapsed and maybe there was a lot of chaos and anarchy in the streets, as it were, in Moscow, it implies that things outside of Moscow continued fairly normally. I mean, where was the money coming from for this enterprise? Well, that's a good question. That's uh, uh, because, see, what was happening all over the place, not only in Moscow, but in the regions was that that was the period the time when well, so-called tycoons or oligarchs appeared and they basically became oligarchs overnight one day they were directors of factories and plants the next day they're owners of it right and uh, that went through a period which we call privatization i mean every person every resident of russia was given a so-called voucher and uh, i don't remember how much it cost but uh, you got several vouchers and you, and that that meant you were part owner of something right so that'd be the place where you lived or the house where you lived? Well, actually, it was, I uh, think, about... Uh, or factories where you uh, worked. Fa yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, what if you're a teacher? You don't own the school, presumably. So no. how did that work? 
No, I don't remember what I what I had uh, owned then, but <laughs> you don't but own it now. said I owned something. Okay, but at least it was uh, it was. Uh, it might sound a bit stupid, but it was something new to us anyway. Because oh, we are owners of a former state uh, property. So well, that these was were a, the Gaidar reforms, as I recall. Yes, that. this was a this was a kind of new feeling of owning something that used to belong to the government. But, but whatever that was, <laughs> we had no idea really. So what most people did, they went out and sold these um, vouchers. And of course, they were buyers representing directors and presidents of companies. So that's how they basically got rich. They, you know, it still uh, begs the question uh, scooped where they... up yeah, yeah. all those vouchers and uh, yeah, became owners of uh, these giant enterprises. It so. still begs the question where the money came yeah, from, however. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good but question. But we'll, we'll perhaps never know that answer. Maybe, maybe in about 50 years' time when they start writing books about that period, maybe. Yeah, because I think that's a deeply concealed secret. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there was a lot of Communist Party money in that, basically, because I noticed that uh, former Komsomol leaders, they all ended up heading corporations and the Chamber of Commerce, which we were part of. We set up a Chamber of Commerce here in Belgorod. The Central Chamber of Commerce was full of ex-Komsomol uh, leaders. So, uh, And I'm sure that they used uh, the money from either party money or Komsomol money and things like that to set themselves up. But let's be clear about this. There were no rules. So they were making up the rules as they went along. Well, so this wasn't exactly criminal activity necessarily. No, no, I wouldn't call that criminal. It was just, uh, you know, a new start. And uh, what you'd call these days, is, uh, you know, they needed startup capital. But where that came from, <laughs> it's hard to say. But they managed and they did it. And basically, uh, it wasn't all negative because it was a it was a good start, basically, for many people. And, and these things that they set up, chambers of commerce and other organization, they're still doing very well, really. So if you were in Belgorod in 1989, and then you, five years later, what had gone and what had stayed the same? Well, uh, basically, I was still at the university, right, making uh, just a regular university professor's salary. But on top of that, I had, uh, I, I could legally start my own teaching business, right? And I had uh, classes uh, all over the place, all over town. I could say, meaning I could make some uh, extra money. I had some, a number of sideline businesses going, teaching businesses, translation businesses. For you then, it was a moment of opportunity that you'd never had. Yes. And yeah. what about in general? I mean, if you wandered around the streets of Belgrade, you wouldn't see any private enterprise, true, in 1989. Well, not, But no. in 1993, you would. Yes, that's when uh, private uh, companies like bars, restaurants, and other small companies started uh, appearing, service stations, you know, more small businesses. There were a lot of them in those days. <clears throat> yeah, and I also remember from my days wandering around in the 90s, a lot of kiosks. Well, yeah. Ki oh, yes, yes, kiosks. Actually, uh, they started with kiosks. Many, I know many businessmen started with a couple of kiosks and uh, they de developed their business, in business into something really significant. Yeah, I remember uh, one guy who started as a uh, private entrepreneur and he owned a small construction business and he had a, an office in a, in a basement of some kind of ruin, half ruined building. <laughs> building. Um, but um, now he's probably the richest man in Belgrade. He owns uh, numerous shopping centers and. All out of hard work. Well, yes, I must give it to him. It, well, it came all out of hard work. The American dream. Yes, yes, come so, true in Belgrade. And you, I know him personally, I know him very well. And uh, I think he really, you know, deserves what, uh, what he did, right? Because he did it through sheer hard work. Mm -hmm. And there are many cases like that, uh, really. But one of the things that I hear uh, from more elderly residents of Belgrade is how much people lost out. Well, that comes from the the people who were, as I said before, were used to be guided and led through the system, okay? I mean, what you really need to do was roll up your sleeves, stop moaning and groaning, and just get to it, right? But that's what they didn't do. They would sit back, moan and groan, and do nothing about it. You're listening to Understanding Russia.
that deals with what was going on in Belgrade to a certain extent. Was there a change in the attitude of Russians towards the West or was there any significant ideas about international relations? And you were heavily involved in it, I know. Yes, on, uh, on our behalf, we were very serious about it and we had very big hopes about uh, developing these connections. And uh, through our Twin City relations, uh, we did a lot of good work, really. But eventually, when things started to settle down a bit, right, and the dust started to settle down, we uh, started feeling that something's not right. <clears throat> First, we had uh, foreign visitors, the United States, Germans, British, Italians, wherever, coming as friends, really, right? They really, sincerely wanted to help. And uh, they came as advisors, as consultants. And at our level, maybe that would have lasted uh, till this day because we had a, a very positive, sincere relationship with them. But somewhere up there, right, I think things started to get sour. I mean, these consultants didn't just become consultants, they became something else, right? So, and... Um, Is this a sort of predatory behavior that yes, you're talking about? Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. And that started to spread from top to bottom, right? And... Unfortunately, what we used to call people's diplomacy in those days, though it worked very well at our level, well, it basically stopped because of the pressure from above, right? And when I say above, not I wasn't talking only about the Russian government, but Western governments as well. We know what it's all about. We're not going to talk about politics today, but we still know what it's all about, right? Well, I mean, in some way, what event did you notice that things had changed? What, what made you think, oh, hold on a minute, this isn't quite exactly what we expect? What, first of all, what did you expect from this new partnership from the West? And then how did you know it changed and what did it change into? Well, that's a good question. And uh, I don't think I'm really prepared to answer it today because that takes a lot of analytical work, right? Because once again, at our level, we did what we were intending to do on both sides. We were... I mean, you were going along quite nicely right and then something changed and there was something you noticed that changed so that wouldn't that wouldn't be necessarily you know a something hidden from you i mean what what the, the whole idea is you had an impression of things being different and better and then suddenly something changed what was it that changed well, not, not really personally me i heard for, i heard the first signs from the regional government or government officials because uh, we were still going strong at our people to people level and uh, we had the lo local government involved in things. And I heard the first signs of something going wrong it was from, it came from the local government saying, oh, they're not the, uh, the way you used to be. They're giving orders now. They're, you know, telling us what to do, how to do it. And uh, so it was step by step that, you know, this thing uh, went on and uh, got worse really over time. So you'd started by building bridges, cultural and business links, and it ended with a sort of new elite coming in and trying to order the Russians to do certain things within well, their own country. Well, and I think the Russians behaved in May, uh, the Russian elite behaved uh, in the same way as well. I mean, one thing led to another. If if the Western elite uh, ordered uh, the and pushed the Russian elite around and they learned from them how to do it, they started pushing us around. So it was as simple as that. And we didn't like that at all. So it, was, it went from a position of hope for the future to being quite toxic within... Well, to, to disappointment, really. Yeah. Well, how long did that take? When did, when did that happen, really? Oh, well, uh, things uh, were rather odd uh, in the mid-90s because uh, Yeltsin, he was, you know, made the impression at first that he was a strong, decisive man. But in the, by the mid-90s, he became a frail old man and a drunk, I think, right? He had a heart problem and uh, a scandalous elections in the 1996, when basically many people were disappointed in Yeltsin and they voted for the Communist Party. And I don't know, as far as I know, I think that the Communist Party actually won. Zyuganov actually won then. And, but it was, it was all covered up and uh, there was a strong uh, anti-Communist Party campaign uh, in the country. And uh, I think it's still a secret to many of us uh, what the final results of, that com of the elections were. If I may be so bold, who did you vote for? Well, I, like uh, many people who had hopes for a better future, hoped for Yeltsin. <laughs> but uh, later we discovered that then we saw what Yeltsin had turned into. That was basically, uh, it took a very short time to realize that Yeltsin probably was the wrong guy. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe he was overwhelmed by events. Is that fair? Well, yeah, on the other hand, but 
we didn't really have a choice because, uh, I mean, it was either uh, Yeltsin with his, uh, well, reforms and things, or it was going back, it was the Communist Party. And uh, when we thought about the Communist Party coming back, we thought about what, you know, what life was then in the Soviet Union. We didn't want that. Back. It might have been different. It might have been a new party. They might have had new visions because they kept telling us, oh, we have an excellent program for developing economy, education, health, blah, blah, blah. We, we heard all that, but we still didn't trust them, right? We didn't want to go back to that system anymore. So that's basically why the majority, or at least a big uh, chunk of the population voted for at least intellectuals, first of all, right? They um, voted for Yeltsin. Did you know anybody that voted for the communists in that well, election? Well, uh, I was a member of this uh, election committee uh, during that time. I, I had to sit um, in the polling station and uh, observe and help things get organized. I know we had a candidate from the Chamber of Commerce. Well, our, I was vice president and he was. Uh, we were trying to have our president elected in, uh, to the regional uh, Duma. When people started coming in, well, there were very few young people. That was probably what, what went wrong uh, because most of them were middle-aged and seniors, right? And especially the seniors, when they came in, they would just ask, okay, who's the communist candidate? And they vote for him. Whether they knew him or not, it didn't matter. They just were voting for the old system and against whatever, whatever else was coming. What did they imagine was going to happen if they elected Zuganov? Looking back now, I think that uh, they would have uh, been bound to change. They couldn't have gone back. But in those days, it was all about euphoria, right? No, no, no Communist Party back. No, no, we don't want that. We just want to go ahead. But if we'd uh, thought about it and analysed it, well, maybe we, we would have come to a different conclusion. I mean, Zugan is still in the Duma now, right? And he's still talking about, but he's still talking about the one and the same thing that he's been there for 20 years now or more, or what, 25 years now, right? Yep. So, and he's still talking about the same thing and he's basically saying the right things. But uh, uh, I understand another thing as well. It's easy to be a member of the parliament, sit back and do nothing and talk, right? But what would he have done if he'd been elected president? It would have been probably a different thing altogether, wouldn't it? You're listening to Understanding Russia. Well, he would argue that having never been given the chance... Well, that's what, yeah, that's <laughs> what you yeah, know? That's yeah. right. That's what Zhirinovsky says as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but I know those guys, those, uh, you know, the, the faction leaders, uh, I understand them very well. I mean, they're just sitting there doing nothing and, uh, and uh, talking their heads off. That's all, right. And they're coming up with all the old information, the old plans, old programs, and saying, look, if, if we'd been elected then, this would have happened, this would have happened, but who knows, would it have happened or not? But anyway, I think one way or another, the day came when Putin was elected. And that thing, I think, that event was a lucky development for Russia. He came from almost nowhere. I mean, nobody knew who he was. Yes, and he still is. Before and he was yeah, president. and we still don't know in many ways. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. We know that he was former KGB. We know that he worked in uh, Saint Petersburg administration. That he was responsible for international affairs. But who selected him? Why he was selected? That's still a bit of a mystery. I know that there are rumors and all sorts of things, but and I tried to read serious books about how he'd been found and things, but I couldn't find any definite information at all. But what happened? What uh, happened? And uh, I'll put it this way: we've never had it better since then. Is, he runs on the idea of stability and national pride. Yes, that's how he started, and that's how he's, he's, <clears throat> what's he, what he's doing now. Well, I mean, the first eight years, probably, when he was in power, we could just feel the difference. I mean, it took less than a decade for us to feel the difference. In what way? In what way? Well, first of all, living standards, quality of life. We had money, we had jobs, we could travel abroad, right? And it took less than a decade after the turbulent 90s when everyone was struggling. Well, I was doing more or less okay, no problem, but the majority of the people were struggling. And now it was all change. And uh, I think what actually changed in the West's attitude towards Russia was, of course, the speech he made in Munich, right? So, and that's when the West realized, oh, look who's talking, right? 
So that was the moment of national pride. Yes, exactly. And, and we could all feel it here in Russia that, look, he made everyone feel proud of their country again. He also brought the internet to Russia yeah, in quite an organised way, didn't he? He did all sorts of things. And he, uh, you, you mentioned the oligarchs, the millionaires who'd ran around the well, country. Well, he distanced them from mm-hmm. himself in many ways. And, they may, and uh, well, I mean, all these stories that we keep hearing about corruption, this and that, uh, I mean, like with everything, truth, the truth, the absolute truth is somewhere in between. Yeah. <laughs> right. But uh, I remember... I told you about my friend, and you know him very well, Michael Binion, right? He he actually, well, he didn't interview him personally, but he was in the Times pool at one of the press conferences that Putin was given. And, uh, well, the question was something like, uh, well, the, it was about what his achievements. What have you achieved over this period? I think his answer was very clever. He said, you don't need to ask me what I've achieved. You can see that for yourself. You better ask the question what I haven't been able to achieve and what I failed it with, right? One of the interesting things I've noticed about the president is how presidential he is. Oh, yes. He's uh, very shrewd. I mean, and look, uh, it's interesting. Everyone's... uh, lambasting him and tongue-lashing him in in the West. But he always keeps calling them colleagues, friends, partners. Yes, our <laughs> friends in America. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's like, and you, and you think, well, it's, you know, why don't you stop calling them friends and colleagues? They're not. They're, they're enemies now. Come right, on. Right, yeah. But look, uh, yeah, I've lived in this country for 60 years now. And, uh, well, Belarus and uh, Russia, and I can look back, right? I mean, the uh, the younger generation don't see this, they don't understand this. That's why they are opposed to many things, right? They want faster changes, new changes. But people of my age, we can look back. And I remember the 60s, the 70s, 80s, and so on. And uh, starting with 2010, I'd say, or even before that, let's say we've never had it better, okay? So that's why we think that, well... Let him carry on as long as he can. Why do we need a change? Look at Merkel. She's been in power for 16 years. So why are they criticizing Putin for being in, in power for 20 years? I, I mean, we need what we want, right? And we need what we need. Yeah. We like him. We know him. He's predictable. He's changed our lives, right? So what's the problem? Isn't it our business to decide whom we want and why we want him? Well, the criticism in the West is twofold. One is that we don't know much about him. He's not a populist politician in that way. And the second one, I suppose, is the lack of opposition. What do you say about that? Opposition has to be fostered. It has to be raised. It has to be nurtured, right? Like in Britain, for example. Uh, The United States, that's chaos, anarchy. It's total collapse, I think. America, American democracy is a dirty word now. But in Britain, I think, yeah, that's where probably uh, uh, the British uh, opposition could be could serve as a good example for other opposition parties. Because uh, if we talk about Russian opposition, there's no opposition worth mentioning. I mean, they just you know, stand-ins for someone, right, or... Is the lack of politics in Russia to do with a perception that things are going well, so why rock the boat? Well, that's one thing, yes, I would agree to that, and and, uh, I'm... Also, um, I support this idea, why rock the boat? Fine, if things are going well, that's fine. But on the other other hand, we have to understand that there's never been any democracy, proper democracy or freedom in Russia uh, until probably more or less recent times, right? I mean, the Russian Empire, serfdom, the communist era, it was all about repression and suppression, right? So no democracy worth mentioning. And when they come out with this notion of give everyone as much freedom as they can take, that's why turned into anarchy and chaos, right? But look, if you just notice, I would call this um, a little bit of democracy. (laughs) (laughs) In the olden days, during the communist period, I mean, the leader of the country, when he's on on the news or he's been mentioned in the news, he has to be given all his titles. For instance, Brezhnev, leader of so, Mr... Uh, Brezhnev, leader of the Communist Party, president of this, leader of that, blah, 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 you know, line of uh, titles, and then Mr. Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev, right? But now when they talk about Putin, it's just Putin, right? (laughs) It's just Putin. Oh, Putin says this, Putin says that. So it feels like you can 
still have a, an opinion on these. But there's no real tradition of Western democracy in Russia, and therefore people are more, more or less comfortable with it. You're listening to Understanding Russia. Because in the West, they see an election result like 70% of the population voted for Putin, and they don't believe it. Well, why should they? And they don't have to believe it. We chose who we wanted to choose, right? It's none of, let's put it this way, it's none of their bloody business, okay? Because uh, he's good for us, we want him, and that's it, right? And um, Western democracy now. I don't know if it's, you can really call it democracy at all these days. That's another question for a different podcast. It is. But, but the, uh, the, here's my impression. of uh, Since I've been here, being schooled, of course, as a Western Democrat, if you like, what I've noticed is that there is not really a culture of confrontation here. People don't stand in the streets and protest. This is something that, that has happened in Russian history, but only in extremis. When people have no food, I mean, when, if you look back at the revolutionary period in, in Russia, the first one in 1905 was about people who were starving, who went to appeal to the Tsar for, for some kind of food and relief. And in the 1917 revolution, the Tsar basically abdicated his responsibilities and therefore left a vacuum into which people came. But the idea of protesting on the street, you had, obviously, in the revolutionary period, there was a lot of protest in various places by different factions. But since then, there has been almost no kind of confrontational, argumentative street action until we get to the 90s, which is why I thought it was another revolutionary period. But it, it goes against the grain. It, it seems that we think of Russia as a sort of revolutionary place where there's upheavals of the masses. But since I've been here, I've not seen any of those upheavals of the masses. Most people, are, you know, if they have a criticism, they keep it generally to themselves and they grumble in their kitchens. But generally speaking, arguments like that, political arguments, don't seem to happen very often. Or am I just being excluded from those things? Is my impression right or wrong? Well, I think, yeah, yeah you're right. You're absolutely right. Because uh, if you look at uh, what's happening in the country today, seriously, what is there to protest against? People have everything they want. They have jobs. They have food. It's generally minorities, tables. isn't it? It's minority protests, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, it's basically... Place, yeah. Uh, it's basically uh, young people, right, who have, and I don't think they know what they're protesting is. And they've just been pushed into the streets, talked into doing this and that, right? And uh, look, they have everything they need. Look at the kids. They drive their own cars. They, they have all these fancy gadgets. They're fed and clothed and everything. So what do they want? What are they protesting against? What else do they want? More freedom? I think they have as much freedom as they need. Right. What, That's what, an what do they want? Thing to say. Uh, you have yeah, as much but, as you can get yes, away but, with. It. But they should come out and say what they want. I, think I mean, it's one thing. So, down with Putin. So, what's behind that? What are you trying to tell us? What's the message? Down with Putin. Okay. Tell us more. Show us more. Give us more. Prove your point. There's nothing to prove. This Navalny guy, right? I mean, he's, uh, he's made a hero in the West, but he's a nobody in Russia. I think he's a, a conspiracy in many ways. So we don't want him, we don't need him, and we don't like him. This is an interesting point of view, which you won't get in, in Western media. The idea that Putin is a bad person is just all over the press but That's now. That's totally untrue. Yeah, but he... I suppose it's just to do with great power rivalry, would you say? I mean, going back to this, I, I, I still want to hit on this point. Russians are free with their opinions. They'll always tell you what they think about things. There's, a, there's definitely a freedom of speech aspect to a lot of things. Now, with some of my students, I can, I can speak about anything with them. But they'll tell me, well, you can't really say that in the street. Or you, there's a perception amongst the young now that speaking out against Putin might get them into trouble. Or speaking out against even you know, this, this institution, the university might get them into trouble. F from my experience in the West, it, you, you can still get into trouble there for speaking your mind about certain subjects. You know, there are taboo subjects and taboo areas. And I think the respect culture in Russia is stronger than it is in other places. But I, I don't perceive a massive difference, a massive gulf. I think if you talk about race in the West or in, in American universities, for example, you can get into lots of trouble. If you talk about politics in Russian universities, or particularly the sort of toxic version of politics, you can get into trouble. You, know, you can get into trouble anywhere by using your mouth, it would appear. That's my personal opinion. But the way to get ahead in Russia seems to be by negotiation, would you say? Well, I would say so, but the main thing to remember is the famous saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? Just 
that's it, because every every nation has its own culture, its own customs, its own traditions. Just try to follow those traditions and you'll be fine. I mean, yeah, you basically people in Russia are outspoken today. They can say whatever they want to say. But there are certain limits, of course, right? I mean, you can lambast the government for this and that, but you have to try and prove your point. You just, you know, can tongue lash anyone just for nothing, which basically also happens. But that's not the Russian way. There's a law against insult here, right? Insult depends on what kind of insult, yeah. I mean, if you, it's a personal attack on someone in public, that's considered to be a taboo area. But, but, it has to, it, but once again, it has to be proved. Yes, it? exactly. If it's valid, if you say, well, this person did this thing, yeah. that's an accusation, it's not an insult, yeah. then that should be allowed, right? So, I mean, it's a, it's a different accent on a different way of doing things. I, 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 I do prefer it. I, I don't well, to... yeah, so I mean, we, Russia is still going through a period of transition and we must understand that, you know, with centuries of uh, suppression and oppression and uh, no freedom, right, things are changing and they're changing rapidly, but it still takes time. I mean, uh, people still look back at those times and, I mean, it's not, it's not been long since the 30s and uh, 50s when people were persecuted and prosecuted for their beliefs and uh, and political views, right, and thrown into jail or sent to labor camps. And that's just what? It's a lifetime it's, away. Uh, yeah. yeah. So people are still, you know, uh, cautious a little bit. Yeah, I say to my students, you, there's an impression here that we live in an ancient country, but Russia actually is only 30 years old, really. Well, basically, the new Russia is, yes. It's not a Soviet culture anymore. And it's not capitalist like the West, and it doesn't have Western-style traditions. And it's certainly not back to the Russian Empire, because that was a completely different animal. So that's These are new people. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a country, a country in, transi in transition. So where do you think the future lies for Russia? What do you think? I mean, neither of us experts on globalization or these things, but do you get the impression we're moving in the right direction? I think so, yes. We'll be doing well. Yeah? We'll be doing well, yes. And what about China now? There's a lot of talk about, you know, whether we can be <laughs> friends with the Chinese. Oh, well, <laughs> I mean, the Orient are the Orient, right? I mean, uh, it's... Uh, Should the question be, a, will a, the Chinese be friends thing. with us rather than when we, sh uh, we yes, should be friends right. with them? Yeah. Yes, it's uh, hard to say because they're emerging as a, a leading power. And, uh, you know, when people or countries become powerful leaders in the world, they tend to change their attitude and become dominant and uh, arrogant. Well, the Chinese have no history of invading the West, so I suppose we're I don't, I don't reasonably, think no. reasonably They'd probably safe. be locally trying to expand. Yeah. Uh, Population-wise, their territories maybe they'll be they'll have territory, but China is a big enough country for everyone to live in. I think, I think that is true. Yes, I don't, I don't perceive a massive threat. What do you think of the young generation? What's your opinion on them? Are you optimistic about their future? Well, they're well educated. Uh, they understand most values. And I think uh, when they mature, under our guidance, of course, <laughs> uh, they, they'll, be, they'll be doing all right. Yeah. The, the other serious problem, though, uh, for Russia, for its future, is the size of its territory and uh, the population. There's a big discrepancy between the size of the country and its population. That's where probably certain dangers lie. That's where China might come in and say, look, we'll help you develop the Far East and Siberia and they'll come and settle. <laughs> well, I thought, I thought that until I read a UN report recently, obviously WHO, I think, that said that in 193 countries around the world, including China, we're in demographic decline. And that there are, the rather than overpopulation, we're now in a situation where living standards have been raised around the world and we're in a declining demographic, which is going to change the game significantly. This is what they say, and I, I can't think that that's not true. We might be at peak population, is what I'm saying. Well, the same in Russia. I mean, uh, you teach students. Have you talked to your students about this, or that they're not willing to have families and get married and have children? Well, not now. Well, I mean, one of the things I ask my students when we when we get into conversations is, when when do you plan to have a family? Do you have, plan to have a family? When do you plan to have it? Now, we do a lot of speech practice, which allows them to talk to me in English. And I ask them a question, when will you have have a child. I ask this of men and women. If they if they say they want a family, I said, well, when will that be? And the usual answer is when I'm 30. 
Uh, well, that that may that makes sense really because look, they have many things to enjoy in life. Now they want to enjoy themselves to the full. They've got all these things. There's no rush. They just want to uh, get a good education, good career, enjoy their lives and their freedom of life, privacy, this and that. And so they don't want to rush into family ties and all those limitations that family life brings about. And so, the expense as well. Yes, and expense as well. And uh, I mean, in the olden days when there was nothing better to do but start a family and carry on in accordance with all the local traditions, that's one thing. But now... They have so many things available to them, so... They have a global perspective, would you say, yeah? Yes, plus a global perspective as well, so... I think the internet has changed everything, yeah. The internet has changed everything. There's been talk in the West about how Russia and China and people like that were going to cut off the internet and, and isolate the people for political reasons. I don't think that's possible. I don't think that's possible, yeah, yeah no. But it has transformed society, would you say? Yeah, of course. And how has it transformed Russian society, in your opinion? I mean, you're not highly connected to the internet, I know that. Well, look, uh, it's, uh, it's an amazing experience for me personally, because during this uh, lockdown period and uh, things, I've uh, really tried to master all these technical things. And uh, I've mastered Zoom, I can do online classes and things. But what astounded me really was that now on YouTube, I can travel all over England by train, by bus. I can visit my hometown. I can visit other places that create nostalgic impressions all by just sitting in front of a computer and doing it. I, I mean, before that, I had my memories, vivid memories of my early days, my youth. And, uh, well, you know, I'm a rather sentimental person. You know, you know that I like I looking do know back. That. Yes. yes. <laughs> so now, with the internet resources and uh, what are the things I can do, just two days ago, I discovered all these wonderful new bus routes that they're putting on and filming on YouTube. And I found. Uh, <laughs> uh, a film about the bus route from Keithley to Leeds, going through <laughs> Bingley, and it took. And I, I uh, watched that film, and it was, uh, and it took me along the same route that I travelled so many times when I was a kid, living that. And what else do you need? Well, it's fantastic. I remember one memorable night with you sitting on my couch, listening to fifties music, and looking at your old house. So yeah, yeah, I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? Yes, amazing. So we've come full circle. Yeah, it's probably a good place to leave it. You're listening to Understanding Russia. We'll leave Val to his trains and buses for now, but I'm sure we'll hear from him again soon. This time doing the questioning, no doubt. If you have been affected by anything you have heard today, then that was the point. Often his views do not reflect my own, but I'm glad that our friendship allows us to disagree and still maintain a good relationship. It is my fervent wish that we could all do that as nation states. Thank you for listening to Understanding Russia. If you want to contact us, you can get in touch with us via our website at urpod.net, where you can find all our social media links, or via email, understandingrussia at gmail.com. We will be very happy to hear from you. You have been listening to Understanding Russia, a student-led podcast from Belgorod State University.